Penny from Heaven by Jennifer L. Holm, Chapter 17, Dumb and Unlucky. Spending my summer vacation at the hospital is starting to be a bad habit. One of the nurses who was here last summer when I was in with my burned back remembered me. Try going to the beach next year, she suggested. Ha, ha, a regular comedian. I'm in the pediatric ward with the rest of the kids. Most of them can be divided into two categories, dumb or just plain unlucky. The dumb kids include a boy who was baiting a dog, and the dog decided he didn't like it and bit off half the kid's ear and took a chunk out of one of his arms. Another knucklehead boy got burned by a camp stove when he was camping with the Boy Scouts. But just goes to show you that the Boy Scouts don't know as much as they're always saying. The dumbest boy is the one who's allergic to poison ivy, but figured that burning it with some dried leaves in his backyard didn't count. His eyes are all swollen, and he's covered from head to toe with oozing blisters. It's so bad that he even has blisters in his mouth. I've never seen anything like it. He looks like he should be in a monster movie. The Poison Ivy Boy. The unlucky kid is a little girl who the nurses hover over. She has blood cancer, and the nurses whisper that she's dying. Then there's me, dumb and unlucky. The hospital's just like a regular neighborhood, and after a while, I know all the nurses and doctors, and even the orderlies. I prefer the nurses to the doctors. They spend time with you and talk to you and feed you and change your sheets and help you go to the bathroom, which, believe me, is pretty hard to do with just one arm when you can't leave the bed. I'm right-handed, and now I can't do anything. It's the little things I miss most, like trying to brush my teeth or cut my own food or even comb my stupid-looking hair. I never knew how important an arm was until now. My Gregory Peck doctor is pretty nice, and our family doctor, Dr. LaFrock, checks on me every few days, but I don't like most of the other doctors. No wonder my mother quit being a nurse. A whole pack of doctors comes by every morning, and they wake me up and poke and prod me and talk about me like I'm not even there. They'll say, the patient has reported that she has no sensation below the brachial plexus. And then they start talking all this medical mumbo-jumbo. One morning, I was so fed up that I interrupted them and said in a loud voice, the patient has to go to the bathroom right now. That got them out of there fast. I get a lot of visitors. My mother comes by every morning, and when she leaves, Mimi and Pop Pop show up, and my father's family visits in the afternoons, and then my mother comes by again after work. I guess someone negotiated visiting times to avoid World War III. My uncles give me presents as usual. Uncle Nunzia brings me some fancy silk slippers with rabbit fur trim and a matching silk robe. Uncle Ralphie brings me a box of pecan cookies, and Uncle Polly gives me some Archie comic books, which I don't like very much, but they're better than nothing. All Betty and Veronica ever do is worry about dating stupid Archie and stupid Reggie. My biggest present is a radio from Uncle Sally. <clears throat> so that I won't miss any of the ball games. All the uncles visit except for Uncle Dominic, who's the one I want to see most of all. Maybe he's scared to come to the hospital after what happened with my mother. Frankie can come whenever he wants, even when visiting hours are over. The nurses think he's sweet because he gave them a big bunch of flowers. Red roses. Where'd you get them? I ask him. Stolen from a dead lady upstairs, he tells me. You stole flowers from a dead lady? It ain't like she needed them, he says and eyes my arm. Guess I'm gonna have to find a new shortstop. Frankie, I say. Sorry. Hey, it ain't all bad. We can get into ball games for free now, he grins at me. Wait till the policeman get a look at your arm. You're better than that crippled kid. I just shake my head at him. What happened to all the money in Nani's basement? Grandpa's treasure? Frankie's face falls. Uncle Nunzio said it'll be used to pay for your hospital bill. It's gonna be some bill, I say. It's not so bad once you get past the boring part. I have a pretty busy schedule. 
Someone's always waking me up to take my temperature or to change the bandages on my arm or to put on clean sheets <clears throat> or feed me lunch. So by the end of the day, I'm beat and I haven't done anything except lie in bed. The other kids are okay. Not that I can be choosy or anything. We're all in the same boat. Since I have a radio, I'm pretty popular. The nurse, nurses wheel the kids into a circle around my bed and we sit and listen to the programs. They even let the girl with cancer out uh, get out of bed. They will her over, but don't let the poison ivy kids sit near her. We listen to the shadow and the lone ranger. Somehow, hearing all the familiar voices makes things seem not so bad. We're like a regular family. We fight over what programs to listen to, and if someone talks, we tell them to be quiet. When we're all laughing and shouting, I almost forget where I am. How are you feeling? My mother asks when she arrives in the morning. What she's really asking is if my arm is working, because Dr. Goldstein said it doesn't move in the next few weeks, and it probably never will. I'll just hang there for the rest of my life, like a roll of salami. But each day when I try to move my fingers, nothing happens. Some days, I don't even think it's part of me. The same, I say. I guess we won't be able to go to Lake George. No, we won't, she agrees. I spoke with Aunt Francine, and she said that Llewellyn was very upset when she heard you wouldn't be coming. I'll just bet she was. She'll have to find someone else to torture. She places the tin on my bedside table. Mimi's out there raising cookies. Maybe you can share them with the other kids. Mother, the other kids are trying to get better, not sicker. She gives me a reluctant smile. Even though I'm the patient, I spend most of my time trying to make my mother feel better about things. Did you find the lucky bean? I ask. My mother nods and opens her handbag and then places the bean on the sheet. We tore the house apart looking for it, she says. I pick it up with my good hand and give it a squeeze. I figure I need all the luck I can get now. After my mother leaves, Mimi and Pop Pop arrive. Mimi bustles around, straightening up my things, pouring me water, brushing my hair while Pop Pop clumps around, complaining about everything that's wrong with this place. He talks to anyone who will listen to him. The doctors, the nurses, you name it. I tell you what, he says loudly, you should have your own room. They're for the really sick kids, I say. What, you're sick? Look at that arm of yours. Doesn't that count for anything? They want you to catch the plague. I sigh, and Pop Pop settles in his, himself in the chair next to my bed. Next, he'll start in on all the injured people he saw during the war. You know, when I was in Europe, I saw things that would make your insides turn purple, he says. I yawn. There was this fella who had all his fingers blown right off. What do you think of that? The boy who got bit by the dog says, Hey! He didn't have any fingers. Could he still pick his nose? Pop Pop scowls. Of course he couldn't pick his nose, but he wasn't half as bad as the other fella who got this fungus and his skin started to fall off. The kid with the poison ivy pulls a sheet up higher. Enough with all that ghoulish talk, Mimi says to Pop Pop. Go take a walk. What? He says. What? I said, stop scaring Penny with all of those awful stories, she says loudly. True stories is what they are, he grumbles, but he hobbles off with his cane. Here, Mimi says, placing a plate in front of me, I brought you some meatloaf. The hospital food is pretty awful, but Mimi's got it beat. The nurse will be mad if I eat it, I lie, trying to look grave. I've never heard of such thing, she says. Turn away, nutritious male. They only want me eating what's on the trays, doctor's orders. She purses her lips and marches over to the nurse's station, and a few moments later, she comes back with a satisfied expression on her face. Well, you don't have to worry about those pesky doctor's orders anymore, Mimi says and beans. That lovely nurse says you can eat whatever I bring you. I groan before I can stop myself. Penny, dear, is your arm paining you? Mimi asks. It sure is, I say. Not to mention my stomach. After lunch, Mimi and Pop Pop leave, and my father's family starts showing up. First is Uncle Polly. He brings Aunt Gina and Nani, who of course bursts into tears the minute she sees me. Hi, Nani, I say. How you doing, doll? Aunt Gina asks. Still alive, I say. You look great, Uncle Polly says. 
which is what he always says. Don't you look great, Gina? Aunt Gina smiles at me. I was thinking maybe we could go to New York City and see a show at Radio City when you get out of this joint. Really, I ask. She winks. Sure, doll. I think you've earned a little fun. Uncle Nunzio and Aunt Rosa show up next, and then come Uncle Sally and Uncle Ralphie. It's hard being in the hospital. I never knew how much socializing was involved. All my visitors want to know how I'm feeling. If the food's okay, the bed's uncomfortable. Nobody will come right out and talk about my arm, even though it's hard to miss. Kind of like Uncle Dominic living in the car. Except Frankie, of course. He talks about my arm all the time. They're going to chop your arm off if it don't work, he asks. You know, amputate it. How would I know, I say. They don't tell me anything. Why don't you ask the doctor? Ask him yourself, I say. Frankie goes right up to Dr. Goldstein. Say, are you going to chop Penny's arm off if it don't get better, he asks. Why do you want to know, young man? Frankie lowers his voice and says, my uncle owns a butcher shop, and fresh arms get good money. Dr. Goldstein grabs Frankie Arms and studies it. In that case, I'm sure you'd be able to make some money on this specimen. I believe we have an operating room already prepared. Hey, Frankie says, yanking his arm back. You even got a license? Dr. Goldstein winks at me, and I laugh. After Frankie leaves, I have dinner, and then Mother stops by, and then it's lights out. The nice nurse with the big laugh, Miss Simpkins, comes over and makes sure we're all okay. All the kids on the ward like her better than Miss Lombardo, who's kind of stern. This is the rottenest part of the day. When the ward is bright and sunny and the nurses are rushing about and visitors are coming and going, it's easy to be brave, to believe that everything's going to be okay after all. It's harder at night when the ward is dark and quiet. I miss home. I miss Mother's voice and Pop Pop's burping, and I sort of miss Mimi's cooking. I even miss the toilet leaking on my bed. You still awake, Penny? The boy in the bed next to me whispers. He's the one who got bit by the dog. His name is Jonathan. Yeah, I say. My back itches and I can't scratch it. I hate it here, he says. Food's terrible. You haven't eaten at my house, I say. I hate it here, too, another kid whispers farther down. Me, too, says another. Pretty soon we're all complaining about the place, like we have any say in it at all. Maybe we can start a club. The dumb and unlucky kids. I lie there and think of all the things I may never get to do. I'll never be able to drive a car or put both my arms around Jack Chesilwig's back while he whispers in my ear that I'm the most beautiful girl in the room, which I won't be. I'll be the girl that mothers point out to their children, the dumb one who doesn't have any sense, like a character from one of Frankie's comics, the one-armed girl. I'm sorry, Penny, my movie star doctor says, but there's no avoiding it. The doctors had been waiting to see if the skin under my armpit would get better, but it got ground up pretty good by the ringer, and now they say I have to have a skin graft, which means an operation. The doctors are going to borrow some skin from my thigh and put it under my arm. It sounds terrible to me. Mother's not very happy about this either, but Frankie's eyes practically bug out when I tell him. Holy Toledo, he says. They're going to carve skin off you and sew it under your arm? That's what they're saying, they say. You're going to look like Frankenstein. Thanks a lot, Frankie, I say. Nah, it's great, he says. Now I just got to get a camera. What for? He looks at me like I'm stupid. So I could take pictures, of course. People pay to see gruesome things like that. The next morning, <clears throat> when they come to take me in for the operation, I'm feeling pretty scared. What if I end up like Cora Lamb in the cemetery being visited by her mother? What if I die? What then? Mother kisses me on the forehead. I love you, Bunny, she says. I'll take good care of her, Eleanor, Dr. Goldstein tells my mother as they will me out. The operating room is a buzz of activity. I look up and see my movie star doctor staring down at me at, on the table. Did you know that your mother and I started at the hospital at the same time, Penny? Dr. Goldstein asks. Mother told me, I say. Did you know my father? He hesitates, then says, no, but your mother was my favorite nurse. He winks. Didn't listen to a thing I said, but she always laughed at my jokes. Tell me one, I say. 
How do you stop a nose from running? Dr. Goldstein asks. I don't know. How? Trip it, he says and grins. I manage a smile. You're better than Pop Pop. I'll tell you another one when you wake up. Then a different doctor holds a mask over my nose and says, now take deep breaths. So the last thing I hear is Frankie's voice and one of the doctors saying, I don't care if you're the president of the United States, kid. No pictures allowed. Now scram. End of chapter 17.